After living in one of the world's most egalitarian countries, Finland, I wanted to find out what it was like to live in Great Britain, where class has played a big part in the country's development. I wondered if it still mattered in the world's oldest democracy. My entree is Richard Bailey. He has a posh, eccentric hobby. A retired engineer, he owns one of three working gondolas in all of Great Britain. From engineer to gondolier might seem like a big leap, but he says he needs both skills when he and his partner, Robin Blandy, launched their boat on the River Thames. It began with an interest in Venetian rowing. Uh, you need to be a pretty good Venetian rower before you can row a gondola. My neighbor invited me for a lesson in Venice um, some 12 years ago. That's where the seed began. The opportunity to row a gondola came 10 years later in Birmingham, of all places, where a Sicilian invited me to row his gondola. This is certainly a Venetian gondola. It was launched on New Year's Day, 1986, and it's named Marissa Cristiano. See your gondolier on the Thames in Oxford. Please hail it, and I will come to the side and give you a ride. You just have to put a little money in my water aid box, which is for people in Africa who don't have clean water. So I'll, the boat is for giving rides. You just call me and I come and you get a ride. You just have to be cheeky enough to ask. Spectators on the shore love the sight. Some can't resist bellowing out off-key renditions of O oh Solo Mio. The, the first reaction is the camera comes up to the face and there's a click. <laughs> uh, later, generally, it's amazement. Uh, sometimes we get the English reserve of, wow, that's so unusual, I better just mock, make a reaction and look the other way, <laughs> which is quite fun. But uh, people are usually friendly and wave and say, nice boat, and that's always very satisfying. But passengers love it even more. They sit back while the two men, dressed in authentic gondolier outfits, row them down the river in great style. It's led to all sorts of other things which are very exciting. It's a rather unusual thing to do, and I enjoy being unusual and meeting different people. Yes, it's led to all sorts of things. So we get, the gondola gets invited and I go with the gondola. So that's, that's fun. Richard and Robin belong to City Barge, a Venetian rowing club. It was founded by graduates of Oxford and Cambridge. Every year, the club joins the Rolls Royce Enthusiast Club for a picnic on the grounds of Woten House, which was built in 1704. April and David Gladstone are the owners. The house, I think, is a very lucky house because, by all rights, it shouldn't exist anymore. In the first place, many, many houses of this kind were destroyed through the 20th century, particularly in the 1950s and 60s. Wooden was sold by the then owner, and the new owners really didn't know what to do with it, so they passed it on. And after a time, Wooden was left empty, rain got in, and there were pools of water everywhere. It was in such a bad state that it was going to be pulled down. And it was only purely by chance, and in the very nick of time, that my late mother-in-law, Mrs. Patrick Brunner, came here, being shown round by an antique dealer who was finding some columns for her. And he came with her to the front of the house, and they stood and looked up at it, and he said, look, you're last because the wooden house is going to be demolished in a fortnight. And my late mother-in-law always said she heard herself saying, as if from another voice, oh, no, it's not. And from that moment, she just knew that she had to save the house. And save it, she did. Parents-in-law, this is they got a grant from the Historic Buildings Council, which had recently been set up to save houses like this then had to match that, at least. They would have spent more than that from their own pockets. Today, the family spends long weekends and lets the house out for conferences, concerts, and other occasions, such as a picnic. 
David, who went to posh schools, Eton and Christ Church, one of the most famous colleges at Oxford University, reads The Guardian, a left-wing newspaper. When I asked him how he reconciled owning such a grand property with liberal views, he said, oh, Woten has always been a Whig, meaning liberal house. For a country which is famous for soggy, wet weather, it might seem peculiar that the British are crazy about the outdoors and picnics. But according to Juliet Dunsmuir, they take them very seriously and jump at any chance to put up a tent, have a pimp's cup, or pop open a bottle of champagne. We love being outside having picnics. And there are different picnics. There are picnics for point-to-point -point racing, which is in March. That's winter picnics in England. And then you go on to the summer. It's Henley and Ascot. And then there is the grand picnics for Glyndebourne, which is the full works, where it is tables and chairs and linen tablecloths and candelabra. The day of the picnic starts early. It takes a while to assemble all the pieces. The cars have to find their favorite parking spaces. The boats are launched, the tents, tables, and chairs set up, and the food organized. By one o'clock, everything is ready. Pim's cup, a concoction of gin, quinine, herbs, and chilled lemonade is served. The champagne is uncorked, and the food is elegantly laid out. Our lunch is by a 1927 silver Rolls Royce, owned by an English couple, but built for a Maharani. The car next to us is its twin, built for a Maharaja. It's an unusually fine day. The scene takes on a lively but languid laziness. I overhear someone say, aren't we lucky? When I first came to Oxford, I ignored the guys selling The Big Issue, a magazine that homeless people sell on the streets, whose aim is to get them off the streets. Maybe it was guilt or the Christmas season, but one day I stopped, bought a copy, and started talking to the young man who sold it to me. He told me his story. His name is Adam Bloor, but everybody calls him Blue. Technically, I've actually been homeless on and off since I was um, 17 but for the last two years I've been sorted out until a month ago my caravan got stolen and I got made homeless and ended up sleeping on the streets because of it didn't have the money to buy another caravan and I got stuck and had to sleep on the streets no other place to go I'm actually sleeping in shop doorways and things like that and anywhere anywhere in the street just put cardboard down and get in my sleeping bag and go sleep and when you're homeless everybody looks down on you throws things at you, start on you, give you abuse and stuff like that because they think it's funny, isn't it? Because you're homeless, so obviously I'm going to try and survive and you just adapt and get used to it, find ways of coping with it, isn't it? It's because um, I'm homeless, it's harder for me to find a job, so um, I um, just sell the big issue instead, isn't it? And um, support myself through that. If people buy a big issue, I mean, that's how I, I survive, really, due to their kindness. At the moment, uh, I have to buy them a pound each so I buy 15 for 15 pound, sell them for 30 pound, and then buy another 15 the next day for 15 pound. But sometimes you don't sell them all, like I might only sell seven one day, and every one that I sell, I get a pound for myself, and a pound goes to charity. So Oxford City Council won't house me, and I'm not allowed in the night shelter. Um, to stay there or even allowed in the night shelter for a shower or a cup of tea or anything because um, I have no local connection to the area which as I said before is um, wrong because I have no local connection anywhere because all my family are travellers. I was brought up in a caravan 
travelling around home schooled, so I didn't go to a local school anywhere. You know what I mean? So I have no local connection to it, no area at all. When I talk to the people who run the shelters, they make a good case for why Blue has fallen through the cracks. Oxford has some of the best facilities in Great Britain for homeless people. The survival book they give me is crammed with services. But it's their job to get people settled, find them permanent homes, and off the dole. Blue likes to live in a van and travel from place to place. Well, I was going to try and sell the big issue, try and save a bit of money up every day, like about five, ten pounds up every day, and then try and buy um, another caravan. And then I'll be off the streets, then I'll have my caravan, I'll be able to travel around again. You know what I mean? But it's going to take um, quite a bit of money to um, save up. Looks like I'll probably be spending another six months on the streets with no help from the council or the homeless charities, apart from um, the only place I'm allowed to go in is the gatehouse um, soup kitchen. Thank you very much. No, I mostly spend my time on my own. It's, it's easier and um, I find it safer. But obviously you need some kind of human contact. Yeah, I know a few people, but they um, live in hostels where they can't have people living with them. And if I lived with one of my friends for over three days a week, it would affect their rent. It, they've got their own lives and I can't afford to stay with them forever, you know what I mean? I have to make my own way in the world. I'm a 26-year-old adult. But his story has a relatively happy ending. One day when I see him, he tells me he's been taken off the blacklist at the shelter. He thinks making this documentary has helped his case. Now he's allowed to use the showers and eat a good breakfast and dinner. He looks good. His face is filled out, he's shaved, and he's upbeat. I look at him and say, Blue, you're handsome. He says, I know. The middle class proved the most difficult to pin down. Perhaps because the range is so wide from upper middle class, which means rich by most people's standards, to lower, which borders on being poor. And many people I met didn't want to be filmed. In the end, I was lucky. Becky and James Salter and Philip Farrell are all people who I felt like I've known for a long time. The Salters seem like an unlikely couple. He's an English cowboy who would like to spend his days on a horse, a hairstylist, who also sculpts, paints, does photography, plays the guitar, and writes music. My ideal imagination of my life would be to be on a horse, on a ranch, in the middle of nowhere. That's my ideal of heaven. My other ideal of heaven is to be on the beach in Venice, just watching, sitting on the sand, watching the sun, and feeling, and seeing the sea. The easiest for me to go and make money from would be my hairdressing, because I could go up to anybody anywhere on beaches, as I have done in the past, and cut somebody's hair just for beer money or, or rent money for the night. It is the most natural and easy thing for me ever to do. You could ask me at any time of day or night to do hair, and I can happily do it. Becky Salter trained to be a New Orleans nanny, the Rolls Royce of British nannies, and has worked all over the world taking care of other people's children. Now Becky and James have one of their own, an adorable one-year-old called Alfie. Uh, I think new mothers just need to relax and do what comes naturally to them. I think there's a lot of pressure um, from reading all the various books, all the childcare manuals. And I think if you relax and do what comes naturally and just do for the baby and forget everything else, you know, you're not going to remember in 10 years' time that you had beautifully ironed clothes, but you are going to remember that you had a happy baby. Alfie, to me now, is everything I've ever worked for, everything I've ever dreamed of, and everything I've ever aspired to be is in him now. And for me, it's all about Alfie. And so everything I do now is back to him. Yeah, James and I just click, and I think um, we've just moved house, and I think this has just proved how well we work together. I work for a living, always have done. I enjoy working. Half my family from Sweden, Swedish nobility, and so I'm working class with a middle class background. James has fantastic ideas and a lot of artistic flair, and I'm a real doer, so together 
a really good combination. Becky and James remind me of people I knew in Venice Beach, California. They've created a relaxed West Coast hippie lifestyle in an English village, proving that opposites do attract. Philippa Ferro is a gutsy lady. With two grown children and time on her hands, she decided she needed a challenge. So when the oldest cinema in Oxford, built in 1911, came up for sale, she and her friend, Jane Derricott, bought it. And that was the easy part. It was run down and the two friends decided what it needed was a woman's touch. Jane, my business partner, and I bought the Ultimate Picture Palace Cinema in East Oxford last July. And we'd been talking to the previous owner for several months beforehand. I was getting to the stage where I was really getting quite desperate. I needed a project. I would also hope that eventually we'll be able to take some money out of it because I have rather expensive children. That is a joke, by the way. I didn't know what I was going to do with the rest of my life. My children have got to that stage now where they're 21 and 19. They're moving on. My daughter lives in London. My son is about to go to university in Rome, I hope. And I'm going to be all by myself. And I'm so desperate for them not to know or to worry that, you know, mum's all alone at home. You know, what's she going to be doing? And I just wanted them to realise that I've got a life. And um, it's a good life. The first thing Philippa did was to rent a truck, drive to Cornwall about 10 hours back and forth, and pick up some new seats she bought cheap on eBay. Then the two women, with the help of Jane's husband and a couple of guys, installed them. They decided that the cinema had to be cleaner than their own houses and got to work scrubbing. Afterwards, they installed a bar. I enjoy it. It's stimulating. It's very interesting as well. And it's very varied. We clean the loose. We hoover the, uh, the, um, the cinema every single day. We sell the tickets in the kiosk. I work in the bar. We choose the films. We do all, everything that you can possibly think of, um, which in, involves running a cinema. The Ultimate Picture Palace has become a community project for Oxford. People come before the film starts to meet their friends, have a cup of tea, or a glass of wine. It's strange. I sort of don't really feel I own the cinema. It's very much a community thing, but I obviously run it with Jane. I like the fact that it's fun, that people come to enjoy themselves. I like selling tickets at the kiosk. I hope I'm always smiling. I don't know whether I am. I think most people think I'm slightly strange because I can't seem to get the three processes right. I can sort of give them tickets, give them change, and mark it down. I can do two out of the three, but I often can't do all three, which is a bit embarrassing. But I like sort of serving behind the bar and chatting to people. It's, it's, I like people. I've always liked people. But the work is hard and hours are long. The two women have to be at the cinema at odd times, seven days a week. So Philip and Jane, with one paid employee, have organized a group of volunteers to help out. They get free movie tickets and wine, and everybody's happy. What I learned in my year in Oxford was, yes, class still mattered, but it's a lot more fluid than I thought. Of course, it helps in certain circles if you have the right accent and know the proper way to hold your knife and fork. But to me as an outsider, it's the huge middle class that includes everyone from the cashier in the supermarket to a high court judge that seems to rule the empire. <laughs>